Good morning and welcome to the virtual worship at Concordia Lutheran Church. Uh, though I can't see you today, it's great to have you here. Blessings to you all as we hear God's word and sing together. Whether you're doing it live at home or some other time, we rejoice that you're here uh, with us gathering together virtually uh, in our worship service. Let's begin with our hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, 
Announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. Who has kept our soul among the living and has not let our feet slip. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, yet you have brought us out to a place of abundance. I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will perform my vows to you, that which my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. I will offer to you burnt offerings of fattened animals with the smoke of the sacrifice of lambs. I will make an offering of bulls and goats. Come and hear all you who fear God and tell what he has done for my soul. I cry to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened. He has attuned to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Worthy is Christ the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Power, riches, wisdom, and strength, and honor, blessing, and glory are His. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Sing with all the people of God and join in the hymn of all creation. Blessing, honor, glory, and might be to God and the Lamb forever. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. For the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Alleluia. This is the feast of victory. 
victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us pray. O God, the giver of all that is good, by your holy inspiration, grant that we may think of those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding, accomplish them. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Acts chapter 17. Now while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and the devout persons in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet, he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man, the times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he was given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Christ has risen from the dead. God the Father has crowned him with glory and honor. He has given him dominion over the works of his hands. He has put all things under his feet. The epistle reading is from 1 Peter chapter 3. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went, and proclaim to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey. 
when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers, having been subjected to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us confess our faith through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now it's time for the children's message. Today I am talking about what Jesus said in the Gospel of John to his disciples. Jesus talked to them about sending them a helper, that he wouldn't leave them alone. Many years ago, I babysat a dog from, from some friends. They went on a long trip, and they brought the dog over to our place and wanted us to take care of him. Now, I don't know if you know this, but many dogs get really, really nervous when their owners are away for a long time. And that was true for, for this dog. Sometimes the dog wouldn't even eat for days after days after days while they were gone. So, the owners wanted to make the dog more comfortable, and they left behind something. They left behind a shirt that smelled like them. So, the dog would be in our house around all of these new smells and all of these new people, and would have something familiar, something that reminded him of his owner. Now Jesus, Jesus has ascended up into heaven. And so he isn't standing around like the disciples saw him. There is no Jesus for you to walk up and shake his hand, pat him on the back, or get a hug from him. Instead, Jesus is up in his throne next to the Heavenly Father. But he doesn't leave us alone. He gives us a special gift that reminds us of him, that helps us to worship him, the Holy Spirit. Jesus said he won't leave us alone. He will give us a gift, the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit isn't there to remind us of Jesus. The Holy Spirit 
gives us amazing things. He's the one who makes us believe in Jesus. Without him, we can't have any faith. He's the one who supports our faith when we're sad or alone or happy or in, in troubled times. And he's the one who gives us the power to follow Jesus, to believe in him and do his will. This gift, the Holy Spirit, is Jesus' way of giving us his love and helping it to grow in our hearts. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, you give us, you give us, your Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit, to give us faith, to give us faith, and to help us, and to help us. Do your will, do your will. Give us this gift, give us this gift, as you promised to do, as you promised to do, through your word, through your word, and your sacraments and your sacraments. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the reasons why the church worships the way it does is because we like to rehearse all of the things that God has done. Our, our liturgy is designed to do just that. We, we, we start out by talking about the forgiveness that God gives us, that because Jesus Christ had died on the cross, he calls pastors to deliver forgiveness to the church. And then we rejoice. We sing a psalm, one of the songs of ancient Israel, and then we sing, this is the feast of victory for our God, that because Jesus has risen from the dead, we have victory over sin and death. And then we pray. We pray about the joy of what God gives us, but also looking forward to the readings that we're about to read. And at that point, God then speaks to us and gives us his gifts through his word, and we hear the stories and the messages and all of the things that God wants us to hear. And then we respond with song by, and by reading our confession. And then God speaks to us again through the sermon. Hopefully my, my words and my message are, are appropriate and joyful for him. And then we offer up an offering and a prayer in response. And then again, in our normal worship services, God gives us the gift of his body and his blood, and we rejoice in song again before he sends us out into the world with his blessing. The pattern of the worship service is there to rehearse the works of God, to praise his name, and then to send us out to do his will. So that when we're out in the world, we can be fed and sustained by God and by his grace. Our psalm today talks about the praise that Israel gives to God and what God does, and it reminds us of his works. Now, our psalm begins right in the middle of Psalm 66, starting at verse 8, but I think you lose what it's trying to say if you don't get the whole psalm in context. So I'm going to read the beginning of the psalm that our reading doesn't include. It starts, Shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sing praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds toward the children of man. He turns the sea into dry land, and they pass through the river on foot. There did we rejoice in him, who rules by his might forever, whose eyes keep watch on the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. And then it continues with verse 8. The psalm moves from one subject to another in an interesting order. It starts out with praise for God's power. But it's not just praise. The next section gives the reason why they praise, why God's power is for them. They praise him for the work that he has already done. When you look at ancient Israel, you can see what, what God had already done, and that's what they refer to. They point back to the Exodus, when God's people were slaves in, in Egypt, and God brought them out, and he moved the Red Sea so that they walked across the sea, walked through it on dry land. God saved them, and they rejoiced there. And the same thing happened again when they got all the way to the Promised Land. After Moses had died, Joshua led the people through the Jordan River. And when they got to the river, the Ark of the Covenant, the priests carrying it, stepped into the Jordan River and the water stopped. It split so that God's people could walk through the Jordan River on dry land. And again, they rejoiced. We too rejoice. We don't point back to the Exodus or to crossing the Jordan River. We point back to Jesus, the Savior who died on the cross, who rose from the dead, who gives us eternal life. And we look back and say, look at the deeds of the Lord. 
Look at what he has done. And it reminds us that God has made a pathway, not through a river, but through death itself, to live in eternal life. Now this pattern that we see at the beginning of the psalm, praise for God's power, but then pointing to what he has done, that's an important part of our praise and worship to God. Because if we just praise God's power, if we just look at the the attributes, the things that he does, how he's mighty and awesome and how he rules over the earth, it actually can be kind of scary. I looked up the top 10 uh, contemporary worship songs uh, for Christians everywhere. The CCLI, the, the licensing company that most churches use, they count the number of times a song is used in worship. So they come up with this top 10. And I I read through all of the lyrics, and I was amazed. All of them, except for one, none of them used the name of Jesus. Only one song in the top ten mentioned Jesus' name. All of them, none of them mentioned his death on the cross. None of them mentioned his resurrection. All of them just pointed to God's power, to his love, to his might. But they never gave a reason why all of his power is for us. Which is why we don't just praise God. We praise God for the gifts he gives us through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We look at all of the works that God has done in the past. And that is the foundation for our faith in God, for our understanding that he loves us, and for the certainty that we have eternal life. The psalm moves on. In verse 8 it says, Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard, who has kept our soul among the living, and has not let our feet slip. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, yet you have brought us to a place of abundance. This psalm uses a metaphor of silver being tried. If you know anything about purifying metals, precious metals like silver or gold, you know it's a pretty uh, awful process. You put the silver in a crucible, and then you put it in a super hot fire. And the fire then will melt the metal until it separates the impurities from the pure silver. And it's only through this fire, this scorching, terrible heat, that the silver becomes pure. And that is what a test from God was supposed to do for ancient Israel. That they would be brought through difficult times and God would use those moments to help them turn to him and ask for forgiveness. That's what was supposed to happen when they wandered in the wilderness. That whenever they faced hardship that they couldn't control, they were supposed to turn to God and say, God, help us. And every time they didn't, God would send something to make them realize that they couldn't do it on their own. But the key behind this is that God provides abundantly, even though he brings us through testing. God brought them through this test to a place of abundance. And we can see testing in individual lives. Consider the story of Job. Job, as you may remember, was a very rich man with lots of children and lots of of flocks and fields. And he had just about anything every ancient person could want. But then he was tested. God took away his family destroyed his crops, burned down his barns, killed all of his flocks, and he even gave Job terrible, terrible sores all over his body. It was a time of testing for Job. But in all of that, Job didn't turn away from God. He relied on God through faith. 
And that's what testing is supposed to do for us. That when God gives us his spirit, he helps us see that only God can take care of us. Only God can love us and sustain us through it all. And so what God wants us to do, the gift that God gives us, is the ability to see a test as something that brings us closer to him. That's what the disciples did in the book of Acts. Early on in the book of Acts, Peter and, and John were preaching in the temple. And in the temple, the Sadducees, they decided that they needed to be arrested because they were preaching Jesus' name. So they brought them into the Sanhedrin and they put them on trial and they told them not to preach in Jesus' name. And then they whipped them. And when the disciples left after being whipped, they celebrated. Can you believe it? They celebrated because they were counted worthy of, of suffering for Jesus' name. This time of testing pushed them closer to God by the Holy Spirit with this gift that he gives you. And we know that God abundantly provides for us through it all. Next, the psalm moves from the time of testing and the abundance that God gives us through it to rejoicing and offering up thanksgiving to God. It says, I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will perform my vows to you, that which my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. I will offer to you burnt offerings of fattened animals with the smoke of the sacrifice of rams, I will make an offering of bulls and goats. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. The psalmist says that when he brings us through times of trouble, he rejoices in God's gifts. Here the psalmist helps us to see that when God loves us and provides for us, we return the sacrifice of thanksgiving. We, of course, don't go around with bowls and blood and offerings and things like that. But when God loves us and provides for us and shows us his mercy, we offer up our thanksgiving to him. This isn't a thanksgiving that is done at the, at the, uh, with a waving finger or an angry face. God doesn't shake our fists at us and tell me, you will thank me, you will praise me, you will give to me. Our offer of thanksgiving comes exactly out of only his love. Because God forgives us, God loves us, God provides for us. He makes us able to offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving to him. It only comes out of the joy of the resurrection and the gift of grace that he gives us. And so we come not just with song, but also with our gifts of our offering. We come with rejoicing to tell the whole world about Jesus when we say, come and see what God has done. Not just in the past, but what he does for me when he brings Jesus' death and resurrection to me and makes me new. This is what makes us rejoice. God's gift for us. In his name, amen. in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Today in our prayers, we remember Ariel uh, Perez and Magnus, her son, 
Ariel is in the hospital and Magnus needs surgery. So we will pray for, for them that God gives them healing. We will also pray for McNeil Hospital, which is one of the hot spots for COVID in the city. We, uh, we pray for all the doctors and all the people who are there. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have done so many wonderful things for us. You provide for us our daily bread and give to us everything that we need. But we praise you most of all for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, that by his death he destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he gave us everlasting life. Teach us to offer our sacrifice of praise that we may show you the, our joy for the works that you have done and give of ourselves to serve those around us, that they may see your gifts as well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you provide for us through all sorts of people, and we ask that you help to give them wisdom and protection during this difficult time. Give wisdom to our leaders, to Donald, our president, to Jay, our governor, to our various mayors and councils, legislatures, judges, and all those who make and administer our laws, that they make good decisions in accordance with your will, out of wisdom and not fear. Bless also those workers who are forced to interact with the public, who are, are put in danger of sickness and disease every day. Watch over emergency workers and give them protection. Bless especially those who are at McNeil during this uh, outbreak of COVID and the hotspot that they are. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Jesus Christ, the great physician, you healed so many when you came down to proclaim the reign and rule of God in the world. We ask that you heal all those who are sick. Bless Ariel and Magnus, Give them healing in their difficult times. Watch over all those whose chronic conditions are not being treated right now. Those who are in pain, we ask that you give them peace and comfort. We ask that you watch over all people who need it. Bless those who are struggling with isolation, whether mental illness or abuse or, or drug addiction. Keep them safe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Watch over your church, O Lord, and give her the wisdom that only you can give, that she may preach the word to those who hear it and find new ways to extend your gospel to communities that can't gather together, that can't show their, their love, love to each other, that can't even see people face to face. We ask that you sustain your church by the offerings of your people, but also by your Holy Spirit, that in this time we may have comfort and the sure knowledge of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All these things we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, Mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. 
Amen. Thank you again for joining us. It's wonderful to have you here as we worship together, even virtually. Uh, a couple of things before we go. Please tune in to my online devotions. We have them on Facebook Live during the week. On Monday mornings, we do This Is Most Certainly Brew. You can grab your coffee and look at uh, Martin Luther's small catechism with me. You may recognize This Is Most Certainly Brew as a play on the words This Is Most Certainly True which come in Martin Luther's explanation for the Apostles' Creed. So join us in as we review the small catechism and take a look at what Martin Luther has to say about God's Word. On Wednesday nights, I do Food for Thought, where I will share one of my favorite recipes. Uh, you may have end up cooking far more than you used to, so you can get new recipes to try something new during Shelter in Place. And then I will do a short devotion on one of the upcoming readings from Sunday. And on Friday morning, I do something similar. So far, it's been Fridays with Fartlick. You get to see my cat, hopefully doing something interesting. Um, so tune in for that and see God's word and hear it as well. On Tuesdays or Wednesdays in the evening, we are starting to do a social hour for um, Concordia. We are doing it through Zoom 
Um, we will send out the information once a week so that everybody knows what's going on. But please look for either the email or a Facebook post with the information for that Zoom meeting. We can gather together and, and chat with, with people from Concordia that you haven't seen in a while. Please also know that we have a letter that's been sent out uh, regarding the, uh, the constitutionally required May meeting in which we uh, approve our budget and elect our officers. We've asked that you return this letter with a vote whether we can push it off into the future a little bit or whether we need to hold it right away. If you're looking to give thanks to God and support Concordia through the virtual work that we're doing, please do so. Um, you can go to our website and click on the giving section. You can also mail uh, your offering in. We sent out a, a, a letter to everybody who had an offering statement last year uh, with envelopes. If you need more envelopes, self-stamped and addressed, uh, give us a call or send us an email to the office and we'll send more of those out to you. And you can also get um, online automatic withdrawal that you can set up as well. Go in peace.